The origin of theater dates back to prehistoric shaman performing a reenactment of the Great Hunt. For children, standing between the firelight below and before them in a massive cave painting of a wild apis above and behind, casting flickering shadows across it so the bull would appear to move. The retelling of this myth of the Great Hunt began gradually to take on various specific characteristics and themes over the many eons, until eventually memorizing an oral tradition containing specific stories became common. According to Harvard Sanskrit professor E. J. Michael Witzel, born 1943 A.D., in his work The Origins of the World's Mythologies, published January 4, 2013, the majority of common themes in the cosmologies and legends of all early cultures the world over seem to have begun in the region of Australia and Oceania by the end of the last North Hemisphere Ice Age, from some 70,000 years ago, when mankind first entered the region, until 12,000 or so years ago when rising sea levels had split much of the land mass there into islands. It is also to this time period and location we owe the invention of the cat's cradle looped string game and the use of cowrie shells as the first form of monetary currency. The earliest myths all involve a universal deity whom created earth as well as angels, or sons, of the cosmic god, who, according to Witzel, act as tricksters and culture heroes. Mankind was created out of mud from earth by the universal creator deity. However, when humans and the angels began to interbreed, God sent the world flood to destroy all life. Of this era of mythology, Witzel studiously adds, an end to the world is missing, noting that at this stage in storytelling, mankind had not yet imagined a future eschatology, nor a messiah or world savior which was an aspect of mystic prophecy added to mythologies much later, following the agrarian revolution, some 8,000 until 5,000 years ago. In the first agrarian, Sumerian, Chaldean, and ultimately Persian cultures of the ancient Levant, the role of the actor was performed by a shaman, or oracle, and the role of the theater was performed by the religious temple and attended solely by the high priests and occasionally by royalty. The content of the play was that the oracle would take a hallucinogenic drug, become entranced, and clairvoyantly foresee the future. During this era, also, the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, now considered to be the world's first work of purely novel fiction. From some 2,500 years ago in the Mediterranean, Greek and early Roman drama was performed publicly in an amphitheater, a structure combining a small, raised, half-circle stage and a larger half-circle of steps and seating surrounding this. The audience sat in the darkened arena, and the back of the stage was blocked off by a curtain, mounted to a proscenium arch as a divider between actors and audience, so that the former could perform set changes unseen by the latter. Although myths informed and infused the performances of all plays penned during this period, most of the plays were not taken as the word of God 
or even as gospel, but were understood to be the playwright's choice for retelling of any given events from their own artistic point of view. Thus, the novel fiction of Gilgamesh became the standard for suspension of disbelief in the earliest dramatic theaters. The role of this form of theater remained the retelling of legends and myths throughout the European Dark Ages as passion plays, festivals reenacting the crucifixion of Christ Jesus. Following the Black Death Plague and the Torturous Inquisition, William Shakespeare, 1564 until 1616 AD, a British playwright under English monarch Queen Elizabeth I, performed his works in the Globe Theatre, a wooden building whose architecture was constructed to mimic the essential features of the Greek amphitheatre a stage, and several levels of seating. In this theater, the balcony seats were reserved for the wealthiest patrons, while the pit between the edge of the stage and the first story of balcony seats was occupied by the groundlings, the poorest patrons. With the Renaissance came the popularization and regularization of musical instrument tuning, and with that began the dramatic art of the opera, combining actors singing and performing on a stage, surrounded by patrons in ascending rows of seats, but with a symphonic orchestra in the pit, formerly occupied by the groundlings. It was at this point the ancient Greek dramatic division between tragedy and comedy began to be associated with financial class and social status, as the wealthy could afford to attend the pricier nighttime productions of tragedies, while the poor could only afford to attend the cheaper matinee productions of comedies. As such media as Three Penny Operas and Newspapers arose to both inform and reflect the popular views of audience members in all social ranks, the wealth gap between financial classes expanded and became increasingly difficult to tolerate. The results of this dawning of the information age were the many revolutions that occurred around the world beginning in America in 1776 and France 1789 to 1799. In America, following its war for independence from Britain, the spark of industriousness was soon kindled into the Industrial Revolution with the invention of steam-powered engines for use in transportation and factories. Not long afterwards, the limelights that had replaced the ancient campfire for low-lighting the actors on stage were themselves replaced by the spotlight of a directed beam from an electrical light bulb. With the spotlight came the packaging of performers as products, billing them as stars, and ultimately the birth of the 20th century Hollywood studio system, which transformed the dominant means of public performance from live theater into cinema. With the invention of the motion picture film recording camera, humanity harnessed what French Swiss film director Jean-Luc Godard, born 1930 AD, has called truth at 24 frames per second. The earliest short films, shot and developed by Thomas Edison in America and Auguste and Louis Lumiere in France during the turn of the 20th century, were produced solely as entertainment, but were already experimenting with movie magic methods of splicing, 
editing, lighting effects, and shot composition, which remain fundamental features of this new technology to this day. When the Central Bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, was established in 1913, the American economy had reached a point of success that allowed D.W. Griffith, 1875 until 1948, to produce the world's first feature-length silent black-and-white film, The Klansman, nowadays recalled as The Birth of a Nation, in 1915. In the roaring 1920s, cinema industrialized art by making it possible to mass manufacture for global distribution countless replicas of a single recorded performance and thus also threaten to usurp the role traditionally played by live theater. A role theater, lest we forget, had once also usurped from the oracular priestcraft's temples of old. In a sense, cinema fulfills an oracular role in modern theatrical temples that live action cannot, by allowing special effects to paint the screen like a blank canvas, thus permitting the camera to show us literally anything we can imagine. The ability of film to let audiences in darkened theaters enter into the mind of a character by literally seeing the world through their eyes has proven a massively useful tool for inducing empathy and thus has become weaponized to generate sympathy for certain causes and mistrust for others, mainly by the U.S. military for political agendas. Propaganda films are among the most deeply ingrained of modern myths in the collective psyche and are the most difficult to deprogram oneself from because they are the simplest and most skeletal format for expression in this medium. The weaponizing of cinema as political propaganda holds true even more so for the first colorized movie, the Wizard of Oz, 1939, than for Triumph of the Will, 1935, a Nazi propaganda film directed by Lenny Riefenstahl, 1902 until 2003. Because The Wizard of Oz was purely fantasy fiction and could thus address more archetypes in our collective unconscious, as we are all, at times, lost, brainless, heartless, or gutless. While the triumph of the will merely objectively records the 1934 Nazi Party Congress in Nuremberg, attended by more than 700,000 Nazi supporters and includes speeches given by Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess, among others. While the meaning of the message is as plain as the difference between day and night in one, the moral lessons one may find from the other are manifold and technicolor. Thus, The Wizard of Oz is actually far more dangerous a piece of propaganda than even Triumph of the Will, as Wizard of Oz succeeds at subtly influencing the viewers' minds in every way that Birth of a Nation succeeded, while in all those ways, Triumph of the Will remains more merely an archival documentary. In spite of the early and great long-term critical successes of Citizen Kane, 1941, an American drama film by Orson Welles, 1915 until 1985, its producer, co-screenwriter, director, and star. The majority of Hollywood movies produced during the Cold War continued to be driven largely by military-industrial motives, resulting in films like Them, 
1954, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1956, continuing to promote the so-called Red Scare panic of the era over Soviet spies in Western nations. Meanwhile, the Soviets themselves were developing what they called truth cinema, Russian Kino Pravda, consisting throughout the Soviet Union's history until its fall in 1991 of a combination of educational documentaries and absurdist futurism, ranging from Battleship Potemkin, 1925, a silent film directed by Sergei Eisenstein and produced by Moss Film that presents a dramatized version of a historic battleship mutiny from 1905, to multiple productions of The Master and Margarita, a satirical novel about the devil visiting the Soviet Union by Russian writer Mikhail Bulgakov, 1891 until 1940, written in the Soviet Union between 1928 and 1940, during the regime of Joseph Stalin. That decade between 1991, when communism collapsed in Russia and the Berlin Wall, symbolic of the Cold War era's Iron Curtain policy, was finally hammered down. And September 11, 2001, when, allegedly, Al-Qaeda a terrorist training network formed from the post-Soviet collapse Mujahideen detonated and collapsed the World Trade Center Twin Towers in New York and bombed one wall of the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. using hijacked commercial airliners. Produced dozens of legendary films and introduced many inspiring new directors. Ahead of the pack came Kevin Smith, born 1970, writer, director, and co-producer of Clerks, 1994, an American independent black-and-white buddy comedy film that was shot for $27,575 and which grossed over $3 million in theaters. Also that year, May 1994, at the Cannes Film Festival, Pulp Fiction premiered, an American neo-noir black comedy crime film written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. Natural Born Killers came out that same year, on August 26, 1994, an American crime film directed by Oliver Stone and based on an original screenplay by Tarantino. Following these successes, the Hollywood studio system decided to test the waters for future projects by releasing Devil's Advocate, 1997, an American supernatural horror film about an unusually successful young Florida lawyer invited to New York City to work for a major firm. As his wife becomes haunted by frightening visual hallucinations, the lawyer slowly begins to realize the owner of the firm is not what he appears to be, but is in fact the devil. This film was followed up by Pi, Faith in Chaos, 1998, an American psychological thriller written and directed by Darren Aronofsky in his feature directorial debut. The story about a mathematician with an obsession to find underlying complete order in the real world contrasts two seemingly irreconcilable entities, the imperfect, irrational humanity and the rigor and regularity of mathematics, specifically number theory. The Truman Show, 1998, was released in that year as well an American psychological science fiction comedy drama about Truman Burbank, a man who grew up living an ordinary life that, unbeknownst to him, takes place on a large set populated by actors for a television show about him. Eventually, he discovers the truth and decides to escape. 
as the turn of the third millennium and end of the first eon, A.D. approached. Hollywood studios outsourced to smaller studios and risked releasing a bevy of edgy and avant-garde films along with others such as the first Star Wars prequel pre-designed to make the sum $924.3 million it grossed in theaters. Columbia Pictures and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer celebrated their 75th anniversaries in 1999. In a November 26, 1999 article written for the periodical Entertainment Weekly, journalist Jeff Gordon Air speculated 1999, the year that changed movies, and quoted election director Alexander Payne as saying, it's like 1939, concluding, not since the Annus Mirabilis of The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, and Stagecoach has Hollywood brought so many narrative innovations screaming into the mainstream. Groundbreaking films released in 1999 include Stanley Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut, the science fiction hit, the Matrix, the sleeper hit, Snuff Flick, The Blair Witch Project, Best Picture winner, American Beauty, Kevin Smith's Dogma, Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman's breakout film, Being John Malkovich, M. Night Shyamalan's breakout film, The Sixth Sense, Fight Club, directed by David Fincher and based on the 1996 novel by Chuck Palahniuk and Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia, to name only a notable few. Not only was 1999 a banner year for creators of unique content, it was also considered a kind of year of the devil, with the character of Satan or some similar supernatural demon being portrayed in a number of films, from Darth Maul in Star Wars Episode I, to Gabriel Byrne in End of Days, to Nicolas Cage's figuratively haunted ambulance driver in Bringing Out the Dead, to Patricia Arquette's apparent possession by Christ in Stigmata, to Kevin Bacon's literally haunted house in Stir of Echoes, to the Invisible Witch in The Blair Witch Project, to the actual actor John Malkovich in Being John Malkovich, to the kid who can see dead people in Sixth Sense, again, to mention only a notable few. Following 9-11, 2001 A.D., the Los Angeles, California, in New York, New York, produced media content, including the military and central intelligence agency's long-standing monopoly on content control in Hollywood and their fleet of corporate news channels, saturated with spies sharing globalist talking points via Project Mockingbird, has become decreasingly relevant in the increasingly telecommunications technology-centric society of the early 21st century. With the rise of free video sharing social media websites like YouTube, owned by Google, in turn owned by Alphabet LLC, we are finally approaching the age when that proclamation, declared by Aleister Crowley, in 1907, over a century before now, that every man and every woman is a star may finally come true. In the current era, 2020 CE, by creating low-budget content on social media websites like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, and partnering with an MCN, multi-channel network, service provider, one can monetize their airtime by selling it to advertisers 
and drive traffic to one's content using robot viewers provided as part of their service by these MCNs and thus become internet famous and Bitcoin rich all from the comfort of one's own parents basement. Now the internet is corporatized by big media companies desperate to cling to the relevance they enjoyed in a television dominated age and these relentlessly censor and ban any competitors who become too popular and threaten to challenge their authority by expressing any contrary views. The World Wide Web of 2020 is an anti-intellectual cesspool of unsubstantiated personal opinions, amateur podcasters, sock accounts, chat bots, and shadow banning algorithms all being employed by different factions ranging from the Pentagon to Antifa, from Pornhub to QAnon. Although the dark web and bit-torrenting is still viewed as illegal digital piracy of copyrighted content and so remains unexplored by most net users, it exists and will eventually be more fully explored and integrated to daily routine.